on the 8th of May 1906, a young music fan treated himself to a night at the Viennese Opera. He was in luck. Wielding the conductor's baton was one of Europe's greatest musicians, Gustav Mahler. Famously flamboyant, Mahler commanded the orchestra with an extravagant passion that perfectly matched the soaring music. That evening stayed with the young fan for life. His name was Adolf Hitler. Years later, Hitler would take to a podium of his own, where he brought to his speeches an intense physicality and almost operatic, maniacal energy. And when you look at them side by side, it's not difficult to see how Mahler, the great maestro, with his arms soaring and his fists pumping the air, might well have inspired the Fuhrer's own volcanic, fatally compelling style. But when Hitler came to power, Mahler's music was banned because he was Jewish. This time I'm exploring the power of music in the dark 1930s, when the soundtracks to Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia were exploited to forge national identity and prop up violent ideologies. You don't decide what the music of the Soviet Union is, we decide. I'll show how music was an instrument of repression and resistance. Our life was so cut, it gave us hope for a short time. How for composers, every piece became a battleground. You can hear Shostakovich slapping Stalin in the face. Bam, bam, bam. And I'll also be asking whether music itself has a moral case to answer. What fascinates me is music's uncanny ability to stir us up, to calm us down, to express every possible human emotion. It bypasses language and reason and aims instead directly for our souls. And that's what makes music so incredibly powerful and also potentially incredibly dangerous. city of Nuremberg, the cultural heartland of Germany, the Nazi party, newly in power in 1933, gathered together for a rally of victory. Here the nation's rich past would be symbolically linked to the glorious Nazi future, and music would be crucial. A performance of Wagner's opera, The Master Singers of Nuremberg, was to kick off the celebrations there, and the new Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, issued party officials with a thousand free tickets. When he arrived in the theatre, Adolf Hitler was appalled to find that it was nearly empty. Faced with four and a half hours of heavy-duty opera, most of the Nazi party rank and file had skived off to one of the numerous beer houses nearby. The Fuhrer was furious, and he sent out a patrol to haul them all back to face the music. For him, this wasn't just an evening of entertainment. Germany's musical heritage, its great composers like Bach, Beethoven and Brahms, were what made the country unique, made it superior. In Hitler's Third Reich, music would be instrumental again in making Germany great. Richard Wagner was Hitler's favorite composer, and the Fuhrer even liked to claim it was Wagner's music that had inspired him to enter politics. Hitler loved Wagner because the music had a kind of grandeur and mysticism and he could lose himself in the kind of uh, passion and intensity of the work. Wagner allows the audience to be kind of seduced into th not thinking and just being overwhelmed. In 
it wasn't just the emotive seduction of the music that the Führer adored, but also the stories of Wagner's operas. Epic German fantasies about nationhood, destiny and sacrifice, with immortals like the Valkyries riding across the sky, inciting men to make war. The music of Wagner is creating a different world and has, uh, speaks of, of gods and speaks of power and speaks of very grand feelings, very heroic feelings. Something that, of course, attracted Hitler very much, creating myths and creating a society, creating an idea um, inhuman in a way. Wagner had also been a fervent nationalist and anti-Semite. Hitler venerated his whole world view. Wagner had been the great champion of the Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art where music, drama, costumes, stunning visuals all came together to create an epic and intoxicating spectacle. And that was exactly what Hitler wanted to achieve, to turn the Third Reich into a grand opera. For the Nazis, politics itself would become a new kind of performance art. It was music that underpinned Nazi pomp and pageantry, creating a powerful display of national unity. This was the stage set for those immersive Nazi spectaculars. Party rallies immaculately choreographed to music. Bands playing, tens of thousands of people marching perfectly in unison. And Hitler up there on the podium waving his arms about like the supreme conductor. When he addressed the crowds here in 1933, Hitler intentionally used the phrase that closes Wagner's opera, The Master Singers of Nuremberg. Wach auf, he said, awake. He'd taken the Gesamtkunstwerk out of the opera house and created an emotional, spiritual, almost religious experience to rouse the entire German nation. The rebirth of German culture was to include bringing the musical tradition to the masses, and the Nazis invested heavily. It was an idea of a long-term education of the people. They spent a lot of money giving concert tickets very cheaply, giving a lot of money to the concerts. For example, the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra would not, could not have survived otherwise. And if one speaks to elderly people today, they say, yes, Hitler was not, was not, in principle, not very good, but he did some good things. This was, he brought work for the people, he bought, built the Autobahn, and he had wonderful music. It's like, what have the Nazis ever done for us? I mean, forget the fact that they yeah. rewrote cultural history and yeah. human history, but yeah. we have still got the Berlin Philharmonic. Yeah. Classical music gave the Nazis a veneer of respectability. These weren't thugs, they were civilised people. They loved Bach and Beethoven and Wagner. The problem with that, for me, is that I also love Bach and Beethoven and Wagner. And it makes me realise, I think, at a very subconscious level, that I think I've 
always assumed that classical music was a good thing, that it's somehow noble or civilised to love it. And yet, when you think about the relationship between music and National Socialism, that is patently nonsense. Merely listening to or loving classical music does not make you a good person. The Nazi enthusiasm for classical music didn't mean they loved all of it. You'd have thought something as simply beautiful as that could not be considered politically dangerous. But in Nazi Germany, this music was prohibited because Mendelssohn, its composer, had Jewish heritage, never mind that he was long dead and had been baptised as a Christian. When the Nazis came to power, they set about creating institutions that would censor and control the kind of music that would be played and the people who would play it. Anything they considered undesirable was labelled entartete Musik, degenerate music. No surprise that to the racist Nazis, music with a Jewish connection was considered degenerate, a threat to German cultural purity. The Nazis said music was an instrument to educate the racial soul. They thought that Jewish blood would influence the character of the music and something bad would come. Because it's not racially pure? I mean, it's nuts. It's like craziness. It is, it is crazy. Mendelssohn sounded very Germanic, but it was not. They said, it looks like Germanic, it sounds like Germanic, but it is not. Real Germanic is only Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, Bruckner, and so on. And if, if we only play the good German music, then the Germanic people will be a better people. As increasing Nazi persecution targeted Jews in every aspect of daily life, Music by Jewish composers ceased to be played, and Jewish musicians were prevented from working. To avoid musical contamination spreading unchecked, there were even handy reference books with thousands of entries. So uh, this is the utterly compelling music and race. Something to send you to sleep at night if you need that. Um, this is uh, a very catchy title, this one, Judentum und Musik, Jews and Music, ABC. This is the uh, Nazis' attempt at a, a comprehensive blacklist of everybody they thought was musically verboten. So you get everybody in here, from the uh, piano teacher up the road to the kind of biggest international figures anywhere on the music scene. If I just take a look at some Kleins, uh, none of them any relation, but let's see, we've got Bernard Klein from Berlin, composer, Charles Klein, who's a librettist from London, Saul Klein, pop music composer from New York. I mean, there's literally anybody you could possibly think of here. Gustav Mahler gets quite a lengthy entry, and, uh, of course, Felix Mendelssohn is in there. It's just to me, a kind of stunning testament to how powerful the Nazis must have felt Jewish influence in music was. It needed to be silenced. The Third Reich's cultural establishment was soon Judenfrei, free of Jews. We have a Deutsch theater, a Deutsch film, a Deutsch press, a Deutsch schriftstuhl, a Deutsch bildende kunst. Eine deutsche Musik und einen deutschen Rundfunk. Der früher oft gegen uns vorgebrachte Einwand, es gäbe keine Möglichkeit, die Juden aus dem Kunst- und Kulturleben zu beseitigen, weil deren zu viele seien und wir die leeren Plätze nicht neu besetzen könnten, ist glänzend widerlegt worden. 
But whatever propaganda chief Joseph Goebbels claimed, the Nazis were depriving music-loving Germans of some of their favorite tunes. I'm sure you recognize this piece. Maybe you walk down the aisle to it. It's Mendelssohn's famous wedding march from A Midsummer Night's Dream. It was, of course, banned, but so much missed that the Nazis tried to fill the void by paying approved composers to write alternatives. More than 40 new scores for A Midsummer Night's Dream were tried, but none of them won over the public. It seems you can't just magic up musical genius. To the Nazis, it wasn't just Jewish blood that was degenerate. They also tried to silence music that was avant-garde, somehow left-wing, or, like this Duke Ellington track, what the Nazis called nigger music. In 1938, all that was judged a corrupting influence on German music was even gathered together in a truly weird exhibition. The catalogue cover sums it up, a caricature of a black man with a Jewish Star of David and a gypsy earring playing jazz. Showcasing the inferiority of the supposed degenerates, the Nazis thoughtfully provided audio booths where you could hear band music. Ironically, long queues formed of Germans eager for a taste of forbidden musical fruit. The only other way to hear it was if you were Jewish. Berlin's Reicherstrasse synagogue became one of the venues for the Kulturbund, a new cultural society. Set up in 1933, here, Jewish musicians and actors who'd been thrown out of work were allowed to perform, though only to fellow Jews. The Nazis strictly controlled their repertoire. Kulturbund concerts were shut tight behind closed doors. Non-Jews were not allowed to attend. Jewish performers could play, say, Mendelssohn, but Aryan composers, Beethoven, Bruckner, Wagner, were banned. This was musical apartheid, a kind of sonic ghetto. Soon, over a third of Germany's half a million Jews had joined the Kulturbund. Music became a kind of refuge from the persecutions of their daily lives. 95-year-old Margot Friedlander performed with the Berlin Kulturbund in the 1930s. Was there one particular production or a show that you did that you really loved doing? Yeah, so Griffin Maritz. Uh, Emmerich Kalman's. Kalman's, Countess Maritz. So that's yeah. a great fun operetta. It was so great fun, and every evening was a fun evening when we played where to why these short pants and had wonderful legs. <laughs> but it was wonderful. It was something that is very hard for me to describe what it meant for us. It gave us a, a hope for, the, for a short time. You came from this very cultured world, yes. which almost overnight kind of disappeared. Yes, you are not allowed to be on the street anymore after eight. You are not allowed to buy newspapers. You are not allowed to have animals, cats or dogs. You cannot go shopping except from four to five in the afternoon. Our f life was so cut into nothing
What was there for us? The Kulturbund could give us Jews a home, could give us something that we loved and naturally missed. And it gave us the feeling we are alive. Margot was eventually sent to the Theresienstadt concentration camp. She was the only member of her family to survive. Even a musician considered Aryan to the core could find working under the Nazis politically perilous. The choice to collaborate or risk the consequences. Garmisch-Partenkirchen was the home of Germany's greatest living composer, Richard Strauss. He would find himself on a moral precipice as the Nazis sought to capitalize on his international reputation. Never a modest man, Strauss was always convinced of his own genius, the last in a line, as he saw it, of great German composers like Bach and Beethoven, Schubert and Brahms. I am the final mountain of a large mountain range, he once said with typical self-deprecation. After me come the flatlands. Strauss was asked in 1933 to become the official face of German music, president of the Reich Music Chamber, the RMK. By accepting, he seemed to give credibility to the Nazis' repressive music policies. Why did Richard Strauss take the job? He was already famous, he didn't need the money, and he certainly wasn't a card-carrying Nazi. He wasn't remotely interested in politics. I think this was about vanity. For Strauss, what mattered most was German culture and his place in it. He'd been banging on for years about issues that were close to his heart, things like copyright, royalties, German music, youth education, and nobody had really paid him much attention. Maybe now things would be different. When Hitler came to power, Strauss's response was, thank God, at last a Reich Chancellor who is interested in art. In his role as head honcho of the Reich Music Chamber, Strauss socialized with Nazi leaders, appeared at state occasions, and sometimes stepped in to replace Jewish conductors who'd been ousted. This is his family home, and it's still owned by his grandson, Christian. What kind of a, a grandfather was he? What kind of a man do you remember him being? He was very friendly, and to us, he was very, very lovely. We had to come to this room when he worked, but we had to not play or play. For many years, there was a taint that hung over him because of the 1930s, the 1940s. Thinking back to the decisions he had to make, how hard was that for him? It must sicher schwierig gewesen sein. Er war kein Held, aber Politik hat ihn nicht interessiert. Solange seine Werke gespielt wurden, solange er in Ruhe arbeiten konnte. Er sagt, ich habe später sagt das, ich habe vier verschiedene Regierungsformen erlebt. Den österreichischen Kaiser, den deutschen Kaiser, die Weimarer Republik und dann werden wir Herrn Hitler auch noch überstehen. So war ungefähr seine Mentalität. This was a dangerous game, playing along with the Nazi regime while also trying to keep his distance. Strauss wanted prestige, but to protect his family too. His daughter-in-law, glimpsed in this home movie, was Jewish. Für ihn gab es die Musik und seine Familie. Und in der Familie hatte er, durch den, dadurch, dass meine Mutter jüdisch war, 
große Probleme und er hat einfach ähm, versucht, sich durchzuschwindeln. If your grandfather hadn't taken that job with the RMK, what would have happened to you? Wir wären wahrscheinlich in einem KZ geändert. Vor allen Dingen meine Mutter. Strauss's troubles would come to a head in 1935 over his new opera, Die Schweigsame Frau, The Silent Woman. He'd chosen to work with a famous Austrian writer, Stefan Zweig, who was Jewish. Stefan Zweig wrote to Strauss complaining about the terrible treatment of his fellow Jews in Germany. Strauss writes a response which goes like this. Do you believe that Mozart was consciously Aryan when he composed? Do you believe that I am guided by the notion of being Germanic? For me, there are only two types of people, those with talent and those with none. It has nothing to do with politics. Unfortunately for Strauss, it had everything to do with politics. This letter was intercepted by the Gestapo. And then, just a few days later, there was a huge row about the opera that Zweig and Strauss had been working on together, Die Schweigsame Frau, because the Nazis wanted to take Zweig's name off any of the posters, any of the programmes, to deny that he had any part in it. Strauss went ballistic, insisted that Zweig's name was put back, and here it is on the programme. But a line had been crossed for the Nazis. Richard Strauss had critiqued them in public, he'd insisted that a Jewish colleague's name appear in print, and he lost his job, and his opera was banned. With his ego wounded and fearful for his family, Strauss still tried to maintain his relationship with the Nazis. He wrote a groveling letter of apology to Hitler and continued to conduct at high-profile events like the 1936 Berlin Olympics. but he never fully found his way back into favor. The conductor, Toscanini, once said, to Richard Strauss, the composer, I take off my hat. To Richard Strauss, the man, I put it back on again. Now, I'm not sure we can judge Strauss in black and white like that. It's not that simple. After all, if you were living under the regime, what would you do? I know I would do everything that I could to protect my family, to protect my livelihood. I would work within that system. It's not very brave, it's not very moral, but it is what real people do when they're living in a nightmare. We tend to put these composers on a pedestal. We expect them to behave better than other people. I, I think that's wrong, actually. Why should, music, why should a composer necessarily be more or less selfish than any ordinary other person? I do think we're allowed to judge the composer. I do think we, we are allowed to do that. And I think as soon as you express yourself in a way that's political or that has influence in, in society, you have the responsibility to make the right choices. Strauss's difficult choices haunted him. In Metamorphosen, written in the closing months of the war, he seems to reflect upon his shattered hopes and the painful complexities of his experiences. It's music of anguish and sorrow, foreshadowing Strauss's own imminent death and lamenting the destruction of the Germany he knew and the culture he loved.
If being a composer in Nazi Germany was difficult, in the Soviet Union, it could be terrifying. Nearly two decades after the revolution, its idealistic promise of a brave new world had given way to the firm grip of totalitarian control. In January 1936, Dmitry Shostakovich, the young superstar of Soviet music, arrived at the theater in a state of nervous excitement. His opera, Lady Macbeth of Mertzensk, was already a huge hit with the public, but tonight there'd be a special guest in the audience. Imagine the scene, Shostakovich scanning the audience, and in particular, the box where he could see several influential members of the Politburo laughing and chatting before the curtain went up. They seemed to be enjoying themselves, but Shostakovich was acutely aware that also up in that box, concealed behind a curtain, was a small mustachioed man whose reaction could make or break his career, Joseph Stalin. The supreme leader's opinion was all important. Stalin, like Hitler, took a keen interest in culture, believing it played a crucial role in society. Lady Macbeth of Mertzensk is a pretty grisly tale. An adulterous Russian housewife murders her husband, kills her father-in-law with rat poison, gets sent to a Siberian labor camp, and ends up dead. It is a brilliant, hard-hitting piece. Shostakovich was on the edge of his seat, nervous, excited to see what the general secretary made of his opera. His stomach dropped when he looked up to the box and saw that Stalin had walked out before the show was over. Shostakovich left the theater, feeling, as he said to a friend, sick at heart. And he was right to be worried. Two days later, Pravda, the official Communist Party newspaper, printed an anonymous article condemning Lady Macbeth. And anyone who was anyone read Pravda. This is one of the most important musical documents of the whole of the 20th century. Now, I've known about this, I've read about this for the best part of a quarter of a century, so to have an original from 1936 in my hands is genuinely very exciting. And it's also really chilling because this marks a turning point in the relationship between the state and its creative artists. The headline here is Muddle Instead of Music. And right from the start, it is the most blistering attack. Here is music deliberately turned inside out. It quacks, grunts and growls. It tickles the perverted taste of the bourgeoisie. The composer has ignored the demands of Soviet culture that all coarseness and savagery be abolished from every corner of Soviet life. This wasn't just a bad review. This was a crushing blow, and it came from the very top. There were rumors that Stalin himself wrote this. At the very least, it had his full support. For Shostakovich, one phrase was particularly frightening. This is a clever game of ingenuity that may end very badly. Shostakovich knew a bad end in Stalin's brutal Soviet Union could be terminal. Stalin was paranoid, obsessed with destroying all potential opponents. He'd begun a mass purge in which millions were arrested on trumped-up charges and then sent to the slave labor camps of the Gulag or executed. Everyone lived in fear. This was the Great Terror, violent political repression on an unprecedented scale. The public attack on Shostakovich signaled that the arts were under fierce scrutiny too. 
writing the wrong notes could make a composer an enemy of the state. Stalin demanded that all creative artists should be instruments of his vision of the new Soviet society. Their duty was to create a culture imbued with positive Soviet values that the masses could easily understand. In the visual arts, that meant bright and cheerful paintings of well-fed, happy Russians. And statues like these of heroic soldiers and contented peasants. This approved style was called socialist realism. Now the same was to apply to music. The problem for Shostakovich and his fellow composers was that while everybody knew what socialist realist art should look like, nobody had the foggiest what socialist realist music should sound like. There was a long list of no-nos, of course. You couldn't write anything too modernist, too formalist, too reactionary, too gloomy, too romantic, too Western. No, what Stalin was after was something that the regular Russian music lover, a man like himself, perhaps, could really enjoy. And if you got that wrong, everybody knew the consequences. Shostakovich lived with his suitcase packed in constant fear of arrest. But he never stopped composing. Even if they chop my hands off, he said to a friend, I will continue to compose music, even if I have to hold the pen in my teeth. Nearly two years after the Pravda attack, knowing it was make or break, Shostakovich offered up his fifth symphony. Had Shostakovich succeeded in creating the happy, optimistic socialist realism Stalin wanted? It certainly seemed a dramatic change in style from his Lady Macbeth. But was Shostakovich's change of tune for or against Stalin? I hear the victory, I hear the, the, the fanfares, I hear the Russian exhibition of power. You can hear the symphony as a big triumph for Stalin himself, or as, 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 as Russia being the strongest and the best nation in the world. At the same time, you can also imagine somebody hearing that music as someone slapping Stalin in the face, bam, 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 saying, listen, what you're doing is totally wrong. To me, this music feels like being mauled by a dog that won't let you go. It's intense and ferocious. In the relentless finale, Shostakovich layers on contradictory harmonies, neither major nor minor, ambiguous to the last. We can't be sure what Shostakovich intended or how each member of the audience interpreted the music. Triumph? 
or terror. What we do know is that the premiere ended with wild applause. This time, the press response wasn't a damning attack from Stalin, but a serving of humble pie from the composer himself. Shortly after that first performance, Shostakovich wrote a newspaper article stating that his Fifth Symphony was a public apology for the errors that he'd made in his opera, Lady Macbeth. Only this being Shostakovich, it wasn't quite as clear cut as that. He wrote, if I have succeeded in embodying in music all that I have thought and felt since that critical article in Pravda, if the demanding listener can identify in my music a greater clarity and simplicity, then I am satisfied. Now, that's a lot of ifs for somebody who's really trying to say sorry. Shostakovich was learning the subtleties and nuances of playing the political game. For now, at least, he'd hit the right notes with the authorities and evaded the gulag. There is one way in which Shostakovich undoubtedly left a message in his music, and it's this. It's a really odd, haunting little sequence of four notes, and it turns up all over the place. It's in several of his pieces. Now, composers for hundreds of years have loved the idea of making music a kind of code where the notes are ciphers that correspond to letters of the alphabet. Bach did it, so did Brahms, so did Schumann. And Shostakovich's cryptogram is absolutely essential for him. Let's hear it again. D, E flat, C, B natural. Now, in the German system, those notes correspond to the letters D, S, C, H. D, Dimitri, S, C, H, Shostakovich. And this is his way of saying, I am putting myself right into the fabric of this music, and whatever you take it to mean, you cannot obliterate me. I love those musical cryptograms, the clues composers leave behind to tantalise us. Crack the code, we think, and we might just understand their innermost thoughts and feelings. Only music isn't that simple. There are no literal answers. It allows us to make of it what we will. And Shostakovich fully exploits that ambiguity in his work. His music is just a masterpiece of grey areas and doublespeak. It's a chimera, a shapeshifter. And even someone as all-powerful as Stalin couldn't control that. Control was exactly what the Soviet authorities demanded. Music was the perfect tool to inspire enthusiasm and loyalty. And in organizations like the Young Pioneers, a kind of communist scouts, music helped to instruct the next generation into the collective way of life. Yulia Maximova was a young pioneer in the 1950s. It's very... Um, it is the kind of music to make you want to stand up and march in line. How much did it instill a sense of belonging in the young pioneers, that music.
А хор — это всегда компания. А компания — это весело. Looking back at it now, do you feel that they really believed in the power of music to get to young people's minds and their emotions? Ну, вряд ли случайно это вышло, потому что ведь мало того, что воспитывался патриотизм, плюс все должны быть вместе, все должны быть, но думать, скажем так, о родине, семья потом. Сначала родина, сначала коллектив, сначала вот это, а потом уже все семейное, легкое, мягкое. In May 1936, an audience of young pioneers was treated to a new piece written specially for children. Peter and the Wolf by Sergei Prokofiev ticked all the right Soviet boxes. It's a jolly, tuneful, accessible story about a young pioneer who sets out beyond the safety of his grandfather's gate on a big adventure. Gutsy young Peter's pioneer skills are put to the test as he tries to escape a wolf in the forest. The classic musical fairy tale is also a political lesson. The subtext of Peter and the Wolf is just absolutely standard Stalinist propaganda as delivered in schools all over the country and in pioneer camps. Who is the wolf? The wolf is the capitalist saboteur. Who are the three hunters? That was the standard depiction of the defense forces. And the grumpy grandfather who says, what do you think about going out there? Uh, you shouldn't be doing that. And Peter says, I can look after myself, is the older generation who won't allow the younger generation to take full responsibilities as a Soviet citizen. And Peter makes the correct decision. He disobeys the grandfather. So you've got to give your first loyalty to your school, to the pioneers and to Stalin, which is exactly what Peter does. Peter and the Wolf's composer, Sergei Prokofiev, would regularly turn his genius for writing crowd-pleasing melodies to suit the Soviet regime. Prokofiev was internationally famous and had spent the 1920s living abroad. But he was deeply homesick for Russia and in 1936, lured by the promise of prestige and lucrative commissions, he'd chosen to return. I think my grandfather really wanted to be back at home. In his teens and 20s, he'd been a, a young star and, and been really successful in Russia. And he'd never quite recovered that level of success. And I think like any artist, you, want, you, you need to be where you're going to be most appreciated. You need to go where the work is. And the work was definitely in Russia. Back in the USSR, Prokofiev was given a swanky apartment in one of the most desirable blocks in central Moscow. He had a maid, a chauffeur, a holiday home. He was well known for driving around town in a blue car when everyone else's was regulation black and for sporting flamboyant Parisian clothes. He must have cut quite a dash in the drab grey atmosphere of 1930s Moscow. Prokofiev knew privilege came at a price, and that to survive under Stalin, he'd have to prove his commitment to the regime. He composed overt propaganda pieces, like this, Toast to Stalin, celebrating the beloved leader's birthday.
that was the best solution. He could just knock something out and then carry on doing what he wanted to do. Maybe he might have to do some works that would appease the state or would sort of fit into requirements. But being such a prolific composer, that wasn't difficult for him. I think he'd always believed somehow he was invincible, you know, and that people appreciated his talent enough to, to, to never come down hard on him. Prokofiev's phenomenal ability to compose quickly to order made him perfect for another Soviet propaganda mission, reaching the masses in their millions by writing music for film. There was a huge culture of cinemas, even in the smallest towns. Cinema really dominated both actual musical culture in the Soviet Union and the authorities' um, determination to control it. Working for the cinema was the principal occupation for Soviet composers. In the early 1940s, Prokofiev worked with pioneering director Sergei Eisenstein, who'd been commissioned by the state to make a film about the 16th century tyrant, Ivan the Terrible. Stalin idolized Ivan the Terrible, and he felt there were powerful lessons to be learned from his reign. So Eisenstein and Prokofiev knew their film had to have a positive spin. Prokofiev created a Wagnerian theme for Ivan, muscular and heroic. The music conveys regal power. Ivan had unified Russia, but through a notoriously bloody reign of terror. For Stalin, that ruthlessness was something to be admired. The victims of his own cruel regime now numbered millions. Stalin was delighted with the film and awarded it a prestigious and highly lucrative Stalin Prize to be shared between the director and composer. Thrilled by their success, Eisenstein and Prokofiev got to work on a follow-up, Ivan the Terrible, part two. <laughs> This time, they took a more psychological approach. Ivan comes across as tyrannical and a bit mad, but that wasn't the message Stalin wanted. This is not a film, it's some kind of nightmare, said Stalin when he saw the movie. Ivan the Terrible was very cruel, he went on. You can show he was cruel, but you must show why it was essential to be cruel. Predictably, Stalin banned the film, and Prokofiev never composed for the cinema again. However hard he tried to please, he found it impossible to strike the right notes every time. Targeted after the war in a new round of attacks, Prokofiev spent his final years humiliated. In a savage twist of fate, he died the very same day as Joseph Stalin. The florists sold out as vast crowds mourned their beloved leader, leaving no fresh flowers for Prokofiev's grave. Making music for the great dictators had proved to be a minefield. Prokofiev, Shostakovich, Richard Strauss, they all suffered. But what of the music itself? Has it been stained by the violence and tyranny of the place and time that produced it? There's one piece written in the 1930s that I think more than any other captures the toxic spirit of the age. Carmina Burana by Karl Orff stirs us up to feel tense excitement with its violent power.
Its hypnotic rhythms chimed brilliantly with the frenetic atmosphere of Nazi Germany, where it swept the crowds off their feet. The Nazi Party newspaper called it the kind of clear, stormy and yet disciplined music our time requires. The Nazis were very against intellectual music, and of course, Karloff's music isn't intellectual. It's, it appeals to the senses, it's primitive. When somebody hits a bass drum, you feel the vibrations in your body. You cannot escape that music. You feel the tension, and you enjoy the tension, and at the right moment, there's this big releasing of this tension. one of the most performed pieces of classical music, a staple of popular culture used by film, TV and advertising, a cliché of macho apocalyptic glory. The music has long outlived the politics of the time. But is there something inherently fascist about the bombastic, unreflective emotion written into its very notes? We might like to think that the music we still love today has nothing to do with the dark and distant politics of a terrible time. But I'm not sure it's quite that simple. I suppose if listening to music can't make you a better, more moral person, nor can it by the same token make you an immoral person. That said, Carmina Burana for me is the ultimate piece of empty music, a load of sound and fury signifying nothing. It pushes our buttons and it tries to provoke our basest emotions. I cannot help but hear the hate-filled ideology it grew out of when I hear those notes. And our willingness today to still submit to its power carries with it, I think, a real health warning, that when we embrace music like this, we also have to recognise that it came out of a profoundly evil regime. Next time, as Europe is engulfed by war, how will music play its part in the battle? and the moral and spiritual collapse that is yet to come.